the right mission uh, for this morning. The, um, the, the ASEAN wide study um, found, and this I found remarkable, that the Philippines is just about the only country in Southeast Asia to have an express guarantee for the secular state. And that for me is quite significant. All other constitutions in Southeast Asia will uh, either install a state, uh, a state uh, religion or recognize the primacy of Asia. The primacy of Asia. Of one religion over the, uh, the others. Only the Philippines will have that express guarantee, which I will explain later. Um, also, just, um, where do I point this? There. Okay. Oh, there. Um, the, um, the, the full report is available on the website, but the methodology was this. I, I looked at uh, the Philippine Constitution, uh, the Philippine um, Statute Law, and also the Philippine interpretations in cases. I also went beyond the cases. I went into some disputes which hit the newspapers, but did not ripen into actual uh, judicial. Uh, disputes like the Politeismo debate in the cultural center of the, of the Philippines. And flowing from that, um, uh, from that uh, study, these are the, uh, just the key um, um, issues that I, I raised. We have a formal separation of church and state. Um, but in practice, we really uh, don't have, um, we don't have that kind of strict, we, should, we do not have a strict a separation as we formally declare in our constitution. That's the first. The second is that um, our church state doctrine is wholly borrowed from the United States. Um, and um, in fact, it will happen that uh, for the Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance, the US Supreme Court, Court will rule against them, and then within the same year, the Philippine Supreme Court will rule against them um, as well. Um, that's the Whites in the United States, Havana for the Philippines. The thing is, uh, the backlash against Jehovah's Witnesses in the U.S. was so extreme that uh, very soon in Barnett, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court um, reversed itself. The Philippines took about 35 years to reverse itself in Ebralina. Um, which also goes to show that maybe the fact that we're such a nice people um, does not really translate well into, into good laws. Um, because then there's never a showdown, and we sort of, uh, we kept on, we kept in our books the explicit, um, well, repression of the, of the Jehovah's Witnesses despite our uh, 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 church doctrine. And um, uh, when we borrowed American um, a constitutional law doctrine, we transplanted it into a different context where the, uh, the rules are, are, are very different. We assume for, well, their doctrine assumes a plurality of many faiths. Uh, we transplant it into the Philippines where we have a dominant faith, the Roman Catholic Church, and have the numbers later. And um, we, it also, it's a theory that assumes that everyone is completely free uh, to change his, um, um, his religion. We are, of course, uh, legally free to do, to do so. I think we have some cultural constraints. The third point is that uh, the doctrine that we borrowed um, assumes that um, religion is lived in the private sphere. And um, I propose that in, Philippine, uh, uh, in the Philippines, organized worship historically has belonged to the public, uh, to the public sphere for many reasons I will uh, describe um, later. But for me, it is captured in the preambles of the Philippine Constitution. You start with our, in the, well, the, the independence that we got from the U.S. The 1935 Constitution, we use the term divine providence. We carried that over into the Marcos Constitution of 73. And in the post-Marcos Constitution that we adopted under Cory Aquino, suddenly we shifted to Almighty God. In other words, we basically said by 87, oh, let's not stop pretending. Let's stop pretending here. Uh, that's what we meant anyway. We might, might as well use um, Almighty God. Um, and um, for me, Religion in the private sphere can be traced all the way back to our colonial, uh, to all our, our colonial past, uh, both um, from the Spanish influence in the Philippines, the anti-clerical uh, roots of the um, of the um, of the Philippine Revolution, the fact that the first concession to the natives 
by President William McKinley of the U.S. upon invading the Philippines was religious freedom. That was the first religion. That was the first right that they gave to the natives. Of course, the last right would be the right to vote, which will have to wait <laughs> until, um, until 1935. But uh, upon the invasion of the Philippines, uh, uh, McKinley acting uh, as, as commander-in-chief already guaranteed uh, religious uh, uh, freedom, his instructions to William Howard Taft that dealing with the friar lands which were confiscated by the Aguinaldo government and therefore transferred to the U.S. government had to be dealt with properly purely as a, um, as a, um, as a purchase of, uh, of land. In other words, that there should be a proper uh, compensation for the, uh, for the friars. And then we fast forward that uh, religion uh, was in fact even part of the, um, of the, of the rise of the left um, yeah, in the Philippines coupled with the role of Cardinal Sin of the Association of Major Religious Superiors and the anti marcus movement. Uh, well, and um, most recently, uh, the, the role of the CPCP in the anti-reproductive um, health uh, movement. Um, uh, Professor Elizabeth Makalakan was one of the counsels before the Supreme Court um, in support of the RH law. And, um, um, uh, well, part of my piece is actually a uh, Benny is that when I mention uh, uh, um, Muslim autonomy as religion in the public sphere, uh, part of my thesis later is that if you look at all the framework of humans, apart from the Sharia, uh, it is all about everything else except, uh, except religion. But I will uh, define the role of religion in that context. But for those of our, our, for those of our visitors uh, to uh, the UP, nothing captures the tensions in the separation of church and state doctrine in the Philippines more than a building that you might have seen on the way to campus. The, um, the Church of the Holy Sacrifice um, um, it is just one block away from, uh, from the UP campus. I have a slide later saying that the building of this church in campus is actually in violation of the Philippine Constitution. We have a clause in the Constitution which prohibits this, but we have a historical plaque on the church installed by the National Historical Commission recognizing all the um, all the national artists involved in the um, uh, in the construction of the church from the architect Leandro Loxi to the painter Vicente Maranzala uh, he, you know the stations of the cross on the walls of the church are by Vicente Maranzala and I think for the first 50 years, students would just lean on the paintings while, while hearing mass. Um, I, I think the protective railings were not installed until about maybe 10, 15 years, uh, 15 years ago. The sculpture was by Napoleon Agueva in some post later, just to, uh, to show you. This is uh, the architect Leandro Loxi, that's the church. Uh, this one is not getting it. Okay, that's the church. That's the cultural center, one of, the, uh, one of his most famous creation, Napoleon Agueva. This is the, the two-sided two uh, uh, crucifix because of the new architecture, the path-breaking architecture of the church. It was a, uh, the architecture, um, it's, it's a rounded um, church. This was before the Vatican II Vatican and was really radical for its time. Uh, the floor was designed by uh, Arturo Luz. I don't know the students ever noticed that. Uh, that's supposed to be the river of life. Um, and then, well, of course, Valenzala, this is the, uh, from the Stations of the Cross, these are his other paintings. His assistant was Alpine You know, these are like the most famous artists in the Philippines. And, of course, it's the prohibition. No public property shall be appropriated, applied, paid or employed, directly or indirectly, for the use, benefit or support of any sect, church, denomination, etc., etc. And um, the, um, when the Board of Regents actually decided whether to, to, to have the, uh, the, the church here, the, the, the first legal opinion said that it was in the, And they just had to revise the, uh, they had to revise the, um, the legal opinion. I actually asked a, a Muslim justice of the Supreme Court, <coughs> what it did, how it was during his days in the 1950s at UP. And he told me that. The UP chapel used to be a, the ecumenical center of UP. It was a piece of barren land where there was a hut. 
And um, so I asked the justice, how did you manage with all the other religions? You know, his answer was so common sense. It was so simple. He said, we had a bulletin board, there were time slots, and you just signed up for the time slot that you wanted. In other words, all the different religions got to use the facility until Father Delaney, uh, John P. Delaney, a Jesuit, became the parish priest of UP and decided it was such a nice place that they evicted the, um, the, uh, the Protestants across the road to Gomercindo Garcia and basically told all the other religions, you know, just to, to leave the place. And, um, and just to show you um, just a bit of uh, UP history, uh, his group became the most powerful group in campus, the UPSCA, UP Student Catholic Action. That the first entity created by the future founder of the Communist Party of the Philippines, Joe Massimson, was a play, and he named it as a play of UPSCA, SCAL, Student Cultural Action of UP. In other words, it, it, it had to build, the, um, he had to recruit his first uh, um, disciples as, the, uh, as in, 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 in uh, uh, in resistance to, uh, to the uh, to the Upsal father, father Delhi. I will now proceed to the numbers because I myself, I, I must thank um, uh, Professor Hernandez, Avi, and the, the rest of HRRC for having given me this opportunity. I have been teaching this course for a long time. As a constitutional law professor, I never look at the numbers. And for the first time, I had to look at the percentages. We are eight, this is, these are the official figures, I will later give you the other official figures. We are 80% Roman Catholic. Islam is registered as five. And then everyone else would just share the bits and pieces. When I gave this lecture abroad, uh, there was a, a foreign, uh, 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 an international conference for the presentation of the various study reports. One of the most mysterious was the power of the Iglesia in Cristo, 2.4%. And having a despite that, having a decisive role in um, in Philippine politics. But notice that apart from the eighty and the five, everyone else would have to um, uh, well ended up sharing the um, uh, the uh, uh, various percentages. I will have a more detailed um, slide which will now contrast the official census figures with what uh, we call the self uh, self reporting by. The various religions. And for me, the most significant gap is that for Islam, officially registered at five, at roughly five, and self reported at ten. Uh, I don't know, Dean uh, Bakani, if, uh, if you will have um, uh, an explanation for that. But um, that for me is the most significant. For the others, the gap is not, not that big. I also learned that. Um, uh, the, um, the various Protestant churches in the Philippines are organized into two uh, uh, major uh, uh, groups, and that the, uh, the, uh, the Charismatics identified with the Catholics and the Pentecostals identified with the, uh, uh, with the Protestants are counted together with them. Although I think I am a Roman Catholic. Uh, for uh, uh, Roman Catholics, I, I think we. Um, uh, we detect, anyway, for me, uh, a, a certain uh, well line between the charismatics and the uh, and the, the traditional uh, Catholics. Um, the um, well, I welcome a representative from the uh, Church of Latter Day Saints. I think the Mormons are the fastest growing church in the Philippines. We have a slide here. Oh, it doesn't show. It doesn't show the breakdown. Uh, for um, for religions, but uh, these are these are the changing figures. Oh, sorry, uh, uh, over several uh, decades, but still uh, showing no significant changes in the proportions. This is the Catholic. Uh, this is the Catholic majority. So, as you can imagine, most of the cases discussed in the uh, in the material uh, deal with the uh, with the Catholic Church. There are um, uh, uh, there are well, there is one case. Uh, uh, dealing with uh, with Muslims, uh, two cases dealing with the Iglesia, Iglesia in Cristo. I never fail to say that the separation of church and state in the Philippines was born with original sin. sin. 
And we never had a chance to cleanse uh, our, ourselves of that. It was born inside the church, the Paraswai church. And, um, and despite the fact that we had, entire, we had an entire revolution uh, that sprang from uh, a, a, a resistance to, uh, to, to clerical uh, abuse, the first draft of the Manolo's Constitution actually said, affirmed, uh, the Roman Catholic Church is the official religion. And the final uh, provision, which adopted the separation of church and state, was adopted only on a second vote and one only by one vote. Um, and oh, down the years, um, church-state separation has been um, has been like, firmly um, established in, in Philippine constitutional history. The Malala's Constitution, the Treaty of Paris, uh, uh, which uh, by which um, Spain transferred um, the, uh, the Philippine Islands to. Uh, um, to the United States, McKinley's instructions, the entire history, constitutional history of the Philippines is not traced to the Manolos constitution. Uh, because after Manolos, um, well, they wrote it in Manolos because they, they were not in control of Manila. And from Manolos, they moved to, uh, they moved northward uh, to, to Kamilin, and afterwards, um, to Kamilin, Tardak, and afterwards, I mean, now shifted to guerrilla warfare. So we trace our constitutional history to McKinley's instructions. That was the first, we call it the first organic act for the, um, for the Philippines. And um, the 1935 constitution, under which we became independent in 1946, and under which we created the Philippine Commonwealth, had the classic uh, provisions on the separation of church and state, provisions that you will uh, inherit in every subsequent constitution. Despite that, uh, the first, well, showdown on the churches, the separation of church and state, but it was the Rizal law. Uh, so this is the, the uh, uh, if, if you look at the debates over the Rizal law, the debate on reproductive health was, was really deja vu. Um, this is the law sponsored by, um, by Claro and Recto to require the teaching of Rizal's novels in all the uh, in all Philippine schools. It was resisted by uh, the Catholic uh, Church. The spokesman of the Catholic Church was uh, uh, Soc Rodrigo, who became so famous because of that debate that he became a senator. Uh, and, um, and this is the, uh, the result. It was, the law was carefully drafted as a compromise with the, with the Catholic Church because Rizal was very uh, vocal in criticizing the, the church in his two novels. That it will be included in the teaching uh, in, in the curricula of all schools, but it is only in the college courses that the original or unexpurgated edition of the two novels will be used. And uh, there, there is a conscientious objection uh, clause for, for students who for reasons of religious belief shall be exempted from taking the, uh, the course. So just to show you. Uh, it had, uh, uh, this is a carefully crafted compromise. And notice the argument of Mariano Cuenco. Rizal says that the idea of purgatory does not exist in the Old Testament, nor in the Gospels, etc., etc., and that the early Christians did not believe in purgatory. In other words, uh, he was saying that uh, Rizal was wrong, although I think the Catholic Church is now saying Rizal is right. Um, um, he further said, majority of the members of this chamber, including our good friend, the gentleman from Sulu, in other words, um, even the Muslims, I, I don't, well, uh, Benny is from Midland, right? yes. uh, but uh, he says, even our, the gentleman from Sulu believes in his protocols. In other words, it was the, uh, the, the point of doctrinal um, objection to um, to Jose Rizal's uh, novels, based purely upon an interpretation of the Bible, something disavowed by the Philippine Constitution. These are the, this is the ruling text now in the, uh, in the Philippine Constitution. And just so that you're familiar with, uh, with the uh, jargon, we call this the free exercise clause, which uh, uh, focuses on the, the freedom of every individual to worship, 
according to his own lights and um, the non-establishment laws, which is a prohibition against the state um, either advancing or inhibiting worship of any of any religion. Um, I will now uh, well, well just review um, issues on which uh, basically uh, well the Catholic majority had its views uh, reflected in secular law or has, well, provoked uh, some resistance. Uh, abortion is a crime, uh, divorce is illegal, the Supreme, uh, well, were it not for a Supreme Court ruling, the Comelec uh, banned uh, uh, um, a, the, uh, the uh, cultural exhibit, Politeismo, was, uh, uh, was, was vandalized at the cultural center. Um, there's been a backlash from the, the smaller Christian um, uh, groups. Well, there is an enterprise in, in, in the South. And the, the most recent is the, the Diocese of Bacolod case, where the Supreme Court um, basically validated. I have some slides here on the Bacolod case. Um, oh, I'll just go back to the Bacolod case later. But um, I just wanted to show you some cases. Uh, that um, just to give you a flavor of constitutional law discourse in the Philippines. <coughs> this is a case where Tabloid said that um, <coughs> sorry about this. Tabloid said that um, um, Muslims do not eat pork because they consider pigs sacred. So, uh, you yeah. know, it was a tabloid, it was crazy, it was true. So the Islamic Dawa Council filed the case against the newspaper. <coughs> saying they found it um, offensive. And uh, the court um, took the side of the, uh, of the newspaper, it ruled against the uh, uh, the Islamic Dawa Council and said that um, I'm sorry, really sorry about my cough. Um, maybe I can leave you to read that just to save my thoughts. <laughs> I'm tempted to take my, my lozenges, but uh, wait, I'll, I'll survive that. Um, uh, so, uh, Notice the court basically washed its hands on a uh, on a grievance by uh, uh, by, the, by by the Muslims. Um, and basically, it was so strict. The court said, "Look, if this is a defamation case, it cannot be a f case filed by the Islamic Dawa Council. We need a live person who was actually offended, and it offended you know millions of Muslims all over the world." Um, that's not good enough for us. We need uh, an identifiable, insulted person. Um, uh, but notice the, um, you know, the lofty rhetoric on um, on uh, on the freedom of um, of religion, and um, but the uh, the disappointing result for the Islamic Dawa Council. I'll proceed to the the biggest uh, showdown with the. Uh, Catholic Church in recent history, in recent Philippine history, the reproductive health law. This is the, uh, these are the clauses relevant uh, to the RH uh, law. The sanctity of family life, the family is the basic autonomy social institution. Um, the the anti-road versus weight clause equally protect the life of the mother and the life of the unborn from conception. And then the right of spouses to found the family in accordance with their religious convictions and the demands of responsible parents. Um, this is an excerpt from the majority opinion in Bowen versus Executive Secretary. Um, the court basically um, um, saying that uh, it will stay away from, from religious matters unquestionably an ecclesiastical matters which are outside the province 
of the civil courts. But the jurisdiction of the court extends only to public and secular morality. Um, so, but having said that, the court then struck down the conscientious objector clause, allowing uh, medical professionals and medical um, institutions uh, to uh, uh, to invoke their free exercise um, rights, saying that the religious freedom of health providers, whether public or private, should be accorded privacy. Accordingly, a conscientious objector should be exempt from compliance with the mandates of the RH. Um, and this is the dispositive, the dispositive portion. Uh, notice that the Supreme Court is even careful uh, not to offend the, uh, the church. Instead of saying that the RH law is actually constitutional, as in fact it was saying, it said it is not, un not unconstitutional, and struck down as unconstitutional basically the, uh, uh, the conscientious objector was. The latest uh, Supreme Court uh, decision uh, on this matter is the uh, Diocese of Baholod uh, case, where the church, during the last elections, had a, a list of candidates, which it said, uh, well, two lists, uh, the, the Team Buhay and Team Malay, uh, Team for Life and Team for Death. And this is the, um, um, this is the church, and that is the, uh, the campaign against the RH law, and then this is the campaign against the candidates. This is the, the X list, is the death list, and that is the life list. Um, so that is the, the Steam Bohai and Team uh, Patai. The inquirer reported that there was a Team Tatai. Um, um, but I leave it to my newspaper to, to give the details. Um, the court said that it was, it, there was nothing wrong with it. Nothing wrong with a tax-free um, religious institution taking part in a in a political exercise, endorsing candidates and campaigning against candidates, saying it was merely part of their freedom of of, of, of speech. Um, I will let me just uh, proceed to, to some items uh, uh, on on the autonomy clauses in, in Muslim uh, Mindanao. And then I would, I would like to make some general um, conclusions. Uh, these are the regular clauses on autonomy in Muslim uh, Mindanao. And um, so there is a firm constitutional basis uh, for, uh, for autonomy. Um, and these are the powers to be devolved. And notice that among them and, uh, is personal, family, and property religions. And at the time the Constitution was, um, was uh, enacted, we already had uh, the, um, uh, we had already enacted into law the, uh, uh, the Code of Muslim Personal Relations as a presidential decree under Marcos. And uh, this is the justice system proposed under the, uh, the Bangsamoro Basic Law. So notice, this is just about the only religious part of the Bangsamoro Basic Law, which basically codifies Sharia into the judicial system of the Philippines. Um, and um, notice also that the, uh, well, we will go into this more specifically in a very short while, but just to uh, I, draw your attention. For Muslims, the justice system in the Bangsamoro should be primary consideration to Sharia and customary rights and traditions of the indigenous peoples in the Bangsamoro. So at the outset, we have a recognition of two distinct groups, the, uh, the Muslims and the indigenous peoples. Um, the sources of Sharia, of course, are straightforward religious. In, uh, in character, Un unabashed, it's quite, uh, uh, quite clear. <clears throat> um, 
note here, there shall be cooperation and coordination with the central government regarding the Sharia justice system with the two different mechanisms involved. In other words, there is official recognition by the national uh, government uh, of, um, of what is essentially a religion-based law. So, um, the, the critics of the uh, Balsamoro Basic Law identify that as, a, uh, as carving out the giant exception to the separation of church and state, but I think it finds sufficient basis in the devolution laws and in the, uh, in the Constitution. Um, this is the preamble of the uh, Balsamoro Law. Notice at the outset that it refers to the Bangsamoro people and the other inhabitants of the Bangsamoro. These are two different groups. Um, and, um, uh, the, um, and that is why when I propose, and in, in the course of the discussions for this project, I sat down with uh, colleagues from the other countries in Southeast Asia. I, I propose that we shouldn't see this issue as, a, as an issue of religious freedom. Um, because, and it's uh, best captured uh, in the next slide, um, religion is at best a proxy criteria. It is meant to identify other elements. Moral, as a political category, to transcend distinct cultural and, uh, distinct cultural and linguistic identities of smaller groups in, um, uh, in Mindanao. In fact, uh, until the Moro National Liberation Front uh, was created by by, by Nur Iswani, um, I would say that, um, and uh, Grace is from the Political Science Department, you um, might have more to say about this, but until the Moro, the MNLF was, was organized, Moro as an identity, well, Moro was of course a, a derogatory term uh, uh, by Spain against the invading. Uh, Moors, but um, I mean they were Tausugs, they were Bakindanas, they were Maranaos. What made them Moro was a uh, was a political movement, a single entity to, to transcend uh, uh, separate smaller identities. Notice also the different terms used. Up to the 2008 Moa AD, which was struck down in the northern Cotabato. Uh, versus government this final case. The term used was Bangsamoro juri, uh, juridical, uh, uh, juridical entity. Uh, Bangsa being, uh, uh, being the Malay uh, word for nation and Moro being the, uh, uh, well, the, the Filipino word for the, for the Filipino Muslim. Um, it became one word in the 2012 framework uh, agreement in a matter of four years. I suppose deliberately to avoid all the defects identified in the, um, in the 2008 uh, MOA, MOA AD. And they dropped the term juridical entity, which just became some amorphous the Bangsamoro. Notice also that in international law, if you use religion as the identifying element, then they would be subsumed merely, and I say merely, <coughs> under the Article 27 Protection for Minorities, cultural, religious, or linguistic minorities, in which case, the right of the minority is only for recognition of their minority rights. However, as the Bangsamoro people, as reflected in the preamble contained in the uh, BBL, they will be entitled, under common Article 1, to the right to self-determination. The same thing with indigenous peoples. Indigenous peoples are entitled to a measure of self-determination, and in this case, are distinct from the um, uh, from the um, mainstream moral population in the, in the autonomous region of Muslim Europe. And my last slide on this topic, and in fact, uh, my point that religion um, is at best a proxy. proxy uh, criteria find support in the content of the um, of the framework agreement. It was just a framework agreement. The content was actually in the annexes, and the annexes really have nothing to do with religion. They're all about transi political transitions, 
uh, wealth uh, and revenue sharing power and sharing organization and then the control over the, uh, the control over the workers. In other words, uh, this uh, paper is about the role of, of, um, of respect for, for religious um, uh, for uh, religious and religious um, uh, liberty and I do not find in the, uh, in the situation in, in the South religion itself as the, uh, as, uh, the issue. I will not come force the views of the, of the uh, commentators. I would now like to, uh, to proceed to my concluding uh, um, points. Um, the, um, well, I contrast what I call the traditional premises uh, to the uh, to the transformed premises in my next uh, slide. And traditional premises of separation of church and state, and the traditional premises of uh, of well, of the dominant theology um, in the Philippines. And um, and my conclusion is that the the issues that we have faced in the separation doctrine in the Philippines are just about inevitable. Uh, traditional uh, theology in the Philippines was temple based and prayer focused. Um, and uh, the traditional state, the traditional liberal state, focused on what is called in uh, constitutional theory as the night watchman functions. It's basically creating and maintaining a police, maintaining the jails, maintaining the courts, uh, keeping diplomats to represent the state, and the most basic of public health uh, requirements, sanitation and garbage collection. Um, but this is all this has all been transformed. Uh, various theologies have expanded to, uh, to a focus on the community, to a focus on the earthly needs of, uh, of, of, the, of more vulnerable uh, communities. I think the words of uh, Pope Francis is a poor church for the poor. Um, and um, I think that was what he preached in his visit uh, uh, to our country um, earlier this year. Um, so in other words, it is a church which has gone beyond the, uh, the temples of worship um, into the communities to minister to their uh, the internet needs. But these are the same needs which are now covered as well by the expanded state by the welfare state, and um, um, a state which uh, attends to needs like clothing, like food, shelter, uh, economic and social uh, uh, economic and social rights, the education of, of children, and therefore the, the overlapping domains of, of both church and state, leading to the, um, uh, to the need to reinterpret uh, um, uh, doctrine. Um, I uh, uh, and that is why in the Philippines the 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 borrowed doctrine we transplanted to the Philippines a borrowed doctrine from from the U.S. Um, which assumed that the religion that was being protected was well was based upon a freedom of worship which was exercised within the private sphere. Um, a, a sphere which, where every individual is left free uh, to, um, uh, to worship. In the Philippines it has been historically, in the public sphere it has been uh, pushed further uh, into the public sphere by, uh, by, by modern uh, developments and thus the, uh, uh, thus the inevitable uh, overlap. And I would like to close with this uh, quote. Um, this is an essay from the early writings of Karl Marx. Um, they call it the, uh, the Romantic Marx, which affirms that the religious life um, is actually part of our communal life, and um, that um, in the end, both the state and religion are embodiments of the, um, of the species life. In other words, perhaps we cannot really avoid the, um, the issues that uh, the various issues that I identified um, in my paper, the various um, uh, uh, showdowns between the um, uh, between the dominant church in the Philippines, the Catholic Church, and the um, and um, 
in the Philippine Constitution. And uh, I think, uh, if at all, the, the, the newest challenge to, to church and state doctrine is not merely that, it's not merely what I identified in the previous slide, that the church has expanded and that the state has expanded as well. But that in between is actually a very active, um, a very active civil society that has basically, uh, well, uh, eaten into the um, into a domain erstwhile reserved either to uh, uh, to religion, and that is the uh, the domain of the spiritual life, or for that matter, the domain of the state, which is the capacity to mobilize communal action uh, towards shared goals. Thank you very much.